Stand by for your big moment. We're asking you to judge the timekeeping of Big Ben itself and its bongs using the 100-year-old pips. This has never been done before and I feel will never be done again. But what you have to do is monitor for us which goes first and in which order. This is Broadcasting House. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Big Ben fades away. I think the pips were a clear winner there. Another reason, as if one was needed, to celebrate this ever-present emblem of the BBC. A very rare on-the-half-hour appearance for the Greenwich Time Signal. A hundred years old today. It will make appearances on Radio 3 Breakfast this morning. And the time is now six minutes to nine. It is exactly a hundred years today since the pips were born. You'll all know, of course, what they sound like, but you may not know that what you hear at the top of every hour is live. It comes from a tone generator, which is apparently a box somewhere in the depths of Broadcasting House in London. The technical term is GTS, Greenwich Time Signal, because in 1924 the original pips did come direct from the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Before that, there were discussions on how you could give people an accurate and exact time signal. Here's Frank Hope-Jones, the chairman of the Wireless Society of London, on how he saw it in 1923. Stand by. Are you ready? The last five seconds of the hour and the last one will be the exact hour. Pip, 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 pip. And so it happened. Well, all of this is in a Radio 4 programme called Do We Still Need the Pips, which is tonight at nine o'clock and is presented by Paddy O'Connell. Morning, Paddy. Michelle, hello. Now, I only discovered about the box this morning um, ahead of your programme because our studio team were telling me about it. Have you seen this item? Yes. So you accurately described it as in the basement of Broadcasting House in the oldest bit. And it looks like a blue-grey shoebox of the type that a very pair, a very sensible pair of leatherette loafers would come in. It's totally <laughs> underwhelming, looks like a completely forgotten bit of old equipment. But it generates the tone. Yes, it generates the six pips. There are sometimes mm. seven. And when they were born, they weren't actually called the pips, they were called the six dots. When are there seven? I'm not sure I've heard the seven, or perhaps I haven't been paying, paying <laughs> You've been attention. Talking over yes, it. Yeah, well, we'll get to that in a sec. Thanks. <laughs> well, the seventh one is introduced for uh, recalibrating with international atomic time. So it comes along like a leap pip. And it was in the 70s that the last pip was elongated to half a second. That used to be that the six dots, then the pips, were all the same length. And then it was decided it would help everyone if the last one would be longer. And when that happened, the gentleman who made the change came on the Today programme in 1971 to, to explain it, because there's always been interest in them. Right. OK, so then we should get to the um, um, to this question of crashing them, which I believe even Justin must have done on occasion. I do feel slightly <laughs> targeted because I was the one you asked to a, to a appear on this programme and I don't know whether there's some statistic showing I've done it more than others but anyway we've we've got a bit of audio now showing the misery of it. Janie Frampton there former referee FIFA instructor thank you very much indeed. That's it from us our editors today were Victoria Gardner and Dan McAdam with me in Edinburgh Katie Hasseldine and Joel Mills the studio directors Sean O'Donoghue and Lee McPhail. Oh dear. Oh. I like the way you, you, you started talking faster at the end, long after the pits had started. And then I just gave up the thought. I'm rectify. just. Uh, anyway, well, look, I'm not the only one, I must say, that this happens to. And I think people probably forgive us, Paddy. I don't know. Have you got lots of people in this programme who are outraged at when that happens? Well, I think it's typically big of you to, you know, play one of yourself. What it, what it demonstrates really is how everything must get in. In, in behind the pips, everyone, the, all the news stories of the 20th century, the moon landings, uh, the invasion of Poland, we've got the archive of that. They all had to wait 
for the pips. The great inquisitors on the Today programme, if we go back in time, John Humphreys had to shut up finally for the pips. Uh, Jim Nocte had to struggle with the pips. Brian Redhead had to struggle with the pips. And it, they're, they're democratic, and that was their point, really. They gave time to the people, because before then, you could have to rely on the church tower, or uh, you, know, you could go to your local observatory. But there's something very democratic about them, which I like. They're also terrifying, aren't they, Paddy? I mean, I once finished the programme a, a minute early, because I was so worried about the pips coming. <laughs> And I misread the clock. We were, we were at a remote location somewhere. I think it was a hospital somewhere. And I, I just panicked completely and finished the programme uh, and, well, and then had to restart it, which, as you can imagine, didn't go brilliantly well. But all because of the pips, which do, do get you as a presenter. Well, I think when you're listening to the radio, they punctuate your day because you can sometimes, with the best will in the world, drift your attention drifts, not from your programme, <laughs> but certainly from ones I'm involved in. But if you're in the house... Uh, you hear them and you sort of, it's a rhythm of your day, it's a heartbeat. It's, it's appropriate, really, that the original Pip's clock is kept in Greenwich near the John Harrison longitude uh, clock because as he gave, you know, time and distance to mariners, I think the Pips give time and distance to listeners because, in a way, they're not really telling us the time anymore because you can get that from your smartphone. They're sort of like a heartbeat. They're telling us the truth. Which, let's face it, a lot of other people aren't on, on the programme. I think so. I think they're truthful. Although, of course, if you're listening now on the internet, you are listening in the past, and Justin is talking <laughs> to you from the future, about 27 seconds in the future, but he can't yes. tell you anything that's happening in the future. Yeah, actually, no, we did have that the other day as well, where I was commentating on a rocket taking off, and someone pointed out that it had already taken off. <laughs> and I, I was commentating on something that, I thought breathlessly and interestingly on something that had mm. happened like a minute before. And that rocket then crashed. But anyway, did then that, crash, the, yes. the, the, yeah, there was no right. connection mm. between the two. <laughs> but did, but the, on your central question, did the conclusion you come to, we don't need them functionally, but we need them as a bit of history. And I suppose without them, we'd have some kind of horrible jingle or something at the top of the hour. <laughs> I think so, yes. I mean, the man who runs Radio 4, whose name I've forgotten, he says that then he's not getting rid of them. And I think okay. he's probably quite sensible. OK, I'm going to stop you for obvious reasons. Paddy <laughs> O'Connell, thank you very much. That's it. Joshua Shell, so and Tom Smithard, our editors. Peter Wise was in the studio. Tom Sutcliffe coming up with Start the Week in a second or two. Michelle and me saying on time. Bye-bye. BBC News at nine o'clock. It is happy birthday. 100 years old today. The Pips. You know the six little Pips we play before the news every morning, Richie? Yeah. We've been playing them for 100 years. Wow. First broadcast at 9.30 on February the 5th in 1924. Uh, when everyone on the BBC spoke like that, RP. Oh, things have slipped, haven't they, around these parts. Um, we know you're always on board with a bit of fun and nonsense. Do you know that I cannot play the pips to you now to demonstrate what they sound like? Legally, they can only be played. I don't know if it's legally. I'm making that bit up. Um, just into eight o'clock and nine wow. o'clock. Yeah, I know. So I, I would demonstrate them by playing them to you, but I can't. So, Richie, uh, you're going to do the pips for us now. OK, so just to clarify, okay. it's five short, short peeps and, and one, one longer long. one. OK. So it's like... Beep, 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 beep. Oh, nice little flourish there. Nice little OK, flourish. here we go. Take it away. Laura, with your... Human pips. It's eight o'clock on BBC Radio Two. Beep, beep, <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Happy birthday, pips! Oh, oh that is so fantastic! A chicken doing the pips, everybody. Bop, 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 bop. It's a guinea pig doing the pips. Today marks the centenary of the six pips here on the BBC. They were first heard on the 5th of February 1924 at 9.30pm. And tonight, Paddy O'Connell celebrates the occasion with a programme looking to the past, present and future of the Greenwich Time Signal. Do we still need the pips? Is it nine? But through today, we're also marking this anniversary in a small way by broadcasting the pips that preceded news bulletins from significant days in history across the last 100 years. 
And now we go back to September the 1st, 1939, when this was the headline. Germany has invaded Poland and has bombed many towns. And here are the pips that came before that announcement. Today on Radio 4, we're marking the centenary of the pips. Later tonight, Paddy O'Connell explores their relevance in Do We Still Need the Pips? That's at nine o'clock. But across the day, we're also acknowledging this anniversary by broadcasting the pips from significant days in history across the last 100 years. Now, just before tonight's PM, we go back to the 10th of November, 1989, when this was the headline. Last night, they stood rejoicing at the top of the Berlin Wall. Only a short time ago, they would have been shot dead for trying to escape to the West. And here are the familiar-sounding pips that were heard on that day. They haven't changed a bit. Old-sounding pips, it's still five o'clock, and this is still PM with me, Evan Davis. All day, Radio 4's been marking the centenary of the pips. And on Radio 3's new music show on Saturday night at 10, the BBC Singers will premiere a new piece by Ben Nabutu inspired by the Greenwich Time Signal. There's a poem inspired by it too. Sean Street Sequence Radio, 10 poems about sound. It's like the pips. Six stanzas of six lines, five short and then a long one. Sean recorded it for us today. Greenwich Time Signal. It's time's edge turned to tone. A statement, a hard fact beyond doubt. The unarguable wall between rooms. And the last long instant is stillness, a centre, something zen, a shape like a lifetime or a snowflake. We need them, these pewter lights so bright. This sharp morse, these cat's eyes in a torn black road, stretching to distance. They enhance our purpose, consummate an hour's wait, and contain anxiety that climaxes beyond speech. While they sound, we control things, we make them. But God spits these pips straight back in our faces every time. Only while the long tone sings do we have it all in our hands. Then the snow melts again. Time presses on. Well, today Radio 4 has been marking a very special anniversary. 100 years of the BBC Pips. At 9.30 tonight, we'll commemorate the occasion with a centenary Pips introduced by the Astronomer Royal. But now, to take us there, Paddy O'Connell spends time exploring the rich history and the arguments around the relevance. This is Do We Still Need the Pips? And there's really only one way that we could begin it. There, that noise, the Greenwich time signal, or GTS, more commonly known as the pips. Six little precise markers of time, each a one kilohertz tone. They've been with us now for 100 years, nearly as long as the BBC itself. But what do we think of these little beeps? And do we still need them? Little dots, musical dots. Now we've come round the pips for nine o'clock. Five little short pips, they're all silver, and the last pip is fatter than the others. In a funny sort of way, they've got a bit of Morse code to them. Blips. Blips. Yeah. Beep. They are the cockroaches of broadcasting. The pips are in control. <laughs> Since 1924, they've marshalled the network, consistently marking the changing of the hour and preceding the news across our ever-changing century. Here is the news bulletin in English. Here is the news. Hello and welcome to the World at One. Germany has invaded Poland and has bombed many times. All Moscow is waiting to give a hero's welcome to the world's first spaceman. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin are now resting before preparing to blast off from the moon this evening. First, the news headlines. 
The Conservatives appear to be heading for the biggest landslide since the Second World War. Last night, they stood rejoicing at the top of the Berlin Wall. These are truly remarkable scenes. The headlines this morning, Buckingham Palace is preparing to announce the funeral arrangements for Diana, Princess of Wales. Britain enters the age of Corona. Today, if you listen to Radio 4 constantly, 24-7 on an average week, and why wouldn't you? You would hear them 151 times. That's 906 individual pips. Or, in total, 2 minutes and 31 seconds of this. I'm Paddy O'Connell, and like a lot of Radio 4 listeners, the pips shape my day, waking me up in the morning and marking the hours until bedtime. But it's not just on Radio 4. They're also heard on Radio 2 and across the world on the BBC World Service. In fact, they've been providing their reassuring beeps for a century now. So, how did it all begin? The BBC, that was then the British Broadcasting Company, was formed in late 1922, uniting a group of British telecoms firms under one licence. On the 14th of November 1922, the first daily BBC broadcasts began, but the pips followed surprisingly quickly in 1924. Why? What was the need? Here's the time historian, David Rooney. Well, time was really important for the BBC right from its founding in 1922, they knew that there were people listening in to the BBC who wanted to know accurate time. There was kind of like a, like a moral good to being precise, and time was an expression of that, and so from the start, the BBC would offer time signals. But they weren't necessarily very accurate. It might just be how accurate your wristwatch was as the presenter or as the producer. BBC knew they needed to do something more precise than that, and two years after the BBC was founded, the Pips were born. <coughs> Stand by. Are you ready? In 1923, the chairman of the Wireless Society of London, Frank Hope Jones, gave a talk on daylight saving. It ended with an exact time signal that he generated, as you can hear from this re-recording in 1932. The last five seconds of the hour and the last one will be the exact hour. Pip, 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 pip. After Hope Jones's accurate time signal, plans for the BBC to transmit the real Greenwich time signal quickened, with the general manager, John Reith, and the astronomer royal, Frank Dyson, keen on the idea. On the 5th of February 1924, at 9.30pm, the six pips were born, coming direct from the Royal Observatory. It was something new, rather radical, and a lot more reliable than any previous time signal. The six pips, they weren't called the six pips to start with, they were called the six dots, were revolutionary in the way that they took out humans from the broadcast chain. That chain of accuracy from the clocks at the Royal Observatory, which was set right by the very stars above, and the broadcast equipment of the BBC. Previous to that, there'd be a human in the way, listening for some kind of time signal themselves, or looking at a clock on the wall and then ringing a bell. You could introduce all kinds of mis errors in that. What the six pips did was to take that out, and there was a direct connection between the clock. It had a set of electrical contacts fitted to it, so that as the pendulum swung, for the last five seconds of every 15-minute segment, and then on the dot, the sixth second, there would be an electrical impulse sent up a telephone wire to the BBC in Savoy Hill, which would then make it an audio tone that could be broadcast. That was revolutionary, it had not been done before, and it meant that you could get the time, wherever you were in the country, to within probably about a fifth of a second. Today, 100 years on from that first broadcast, you can visit the Royal Observatory Greenwich and seek out the original Pip-Pip clock. Their curator of time, Emily Ackermans, was our guide. So we, we've come to find the device that gave birth to the dots which became the pips. It is the dent clock. 
Yes, so this is DENT 2016, which was originally made in 18... It was ordered in 1817, and you can see here it's made by Edward Dent & Co. of the Strand. Um, and it has a little sign here saying GMT, which just to indicate that the time shown by the dial is Greenwich Mean Time. But this was a clock that was repurposed to send the electronic signal, the electric yes. signal. Yes. So did, it, did they add contacts into the motion? Yes, so contacts were added um, in, in 1923, I believe, for the 1924 service. And the BBC paid £20 for each clock to be adapted to, to be able to use the service. It looks like an elaborate clock face, a more scientific clock face on a grandfather clock. The pips didn't stay in Greenwich for too long. In 1939, they were evacuated from wartime London to the safety of Surrey. Then, in 1957, they moved again, joining the Royal Observatory at its new home at Hurstmonceau Castle in Sussex. Whilst there, the pips underwent a drastic change when the last beep grew from a into a That's from one-tenth of a second to a whole half a second. Why? Well, this is a minor change, really. Uh, we want to lengthen the last pip so as to label it. You see, if somebody switches on in the middle of the pips, he never knows uh, which is the last pip, or if there's some fault in transmission, then uh, nobody knows which it is. But if one of them is lengthened, the, the, the crucial one, the last one, then there's no mistaking. That was Dr Alan Hunter in 1971. He explained on the Today programme about the extended last pip, a necessary development at the time, due to the introduction of an occasional seventh pip, which is still required to keep us happily synchronised with international atomic time. Then, in 1990, the pips were on the move again. You're listening to Today on Radio 4 with Peter Hobday and Chris Lowe, and here are those pips. That totally underwhelming event was the last time the pips came from the Royal Observatory. On that day, the 5th of February 1990, the pips became the sole responsibility of the BBC and they moved to their new home of Broadcasting House. And here they still reside today. I've worked here for a few years but have never actually seen the machine that produces these dots. So it was clearly time to go on a little journey and find the source of the pips. To get there, you must travel down by lift to the basement of Broadcasting House. Through a large double door, you turn right along a brightly lit windowless corridor. At the end, climb up a concrete staircase and with help from our trusted guide, Thomas Hudson, pass through a locked door into a chilly, air-conditioned room. There, amidst racks of metal shelving stuffed with incomprehensible computers, is the piece of hardware that I'd longed to see. Is it not that, is it, down there? Yes, just where I'm pointing now, there's a very uninteresting grey box ah. with a small screen with a time on it, and that is the pips box. It looks like a spare part, but for me, it's the heart and soul of what this building is. But for how much longer? Despite 100 years of service, those six dots do have their detractors. One listener recently described them to us as an audio torture technique. And some people would like nothing more than to pull the plug on the pips. But why? Well, for one thing, they can be a bit of a nuisance, especially when people talk all over them, otherwise known as crashing the Pips. Baby. Oh, I've crashed the pips. Sorry. Um, have you ever crashed them yourself? To today on Radio 4. No. Well, that's because I've got to not crash the pips for the news. Crashing the pips. John, do we just crash into them now? Yeah, that's it. That's do you take for hours in danger crashing over the pips? Have a great day. They're very good at this. Please don't crash the pips. And not speak over or crash the pips. Oh. 
That's the way of crashing the pips. Allowed. And so we did crash the pips in fairly catastrophic fashion. You see, this is the problem, isn't it? What, you've got to talk I, up I've to got the pips. I've got to talk up to You're doing brilliant. And I think I've done quite well. Yeah. I've stopped myself just for an extra nine seconds. Uh, but first, it is time for the news <laughs> with Jane Steele. <laughs> right. Crashing the pips is almost painful. This is Jane Steele, lead announcer and newsreader on Radio 4. Because, of course, the noise interrupts you, so it almost hurts. And sometimes one kisses the pips, that's not so bad, because it's just a tiny bit and you think, that's fine, I can get away with that. But if it's a full-on crash, it stays with you. It's, now it's irritating. When I first started, like I say, it almost hurt. Well, if there are occasional crashes in continuity, spare a thought for the Today programme where the pips can trigger a pile-up. Here are John Humphreys and Jim Nocte ploughing their way through one such occasion in 2012. So, what do Today presenters really think of the pips. Yes, because actually we're the only programme that actually talks. Because the news I met Michelle right Hussain to ask her. You know, um, when you started out on the Today programme, did you live in fear of the pips? Were they like a, a, a mistress, master? Definitely in fear of them right at the beginning. And I think they, they have also taught me a lot because they've taught me to read time in a different way. When I worked in television, if someone said to you, you've got 30 seconds to fill, you'd feel like 30 seconds was such a long period of time and now when I look at 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 how the last 20 seconds of the program before you hit the have to get to 59 54 which is the safe moment to stop before the pips start just how quickly they disappear it's like a speeding car and often I feel you are in that speeding car with a roadblock in front of you which is the which is the pip so there's a kind of horror and and also a challenge in trying to slam the brakes on the car just before Sounds First like pit. an anxiety dream, the way it's... <laughs> and Dan McAdam with me in Edinburgh, Katie Hasseldine and Joel Moores, the studio directors, Sean O'Donoghue and Lee McPhail. Do you like to hear them? Do they punctuate your day when you're at home? And, and, and do they, have they always been there when you think about it? Yes, I certainly always listen to how my colleagues have handled them. They're also a testament of the relationship between presenters because in a co-presented programme like today, it's the presenter who's doing the bit just before you, if you're the one in charge of reading up to the pips, who can drop you in it <laughs> or destroy your chances <laughs> of, of doing it cleanly. So it's kind of that, test of trust between between the two of you as well that, that comes into it. So if you if you do crash the pips you can always blame it on your co-presenter. <laughs> and hand it in as soon as possible. Luckily for Michelle, I don't think she's ever co-presented with this man. To let you know about today's weather, it'll start in the oh shit. It There's the time. Indeed, there is the time with the Pips and Chris Morris on the classic news spoof on the hour, which isn't alone in finding comedy value in these beeps. Dead Ringers, Just a Minute, The Now Show, even back to the Burkis Way, all of them in radio comedy have a rich history in finding laughter in the GTS. Over to this man talking Pips and Giggles. Well, are the Pips... A good focus of comedy. This is John Holmes, the man behind The Skewer and Listen Against. Well, absolutely they are. And the reason for that is because they're woven into the very fabric of the sound of Radio 4, of course. And so they're instantly recognisable by the audience. And who knew, though, you could get decades of jokes out of six one kilohertz tones? It's not the first time that the pips have caused controversy. In 1963, for instance, a short-lived jazz version of the pips went down like a dead balloon. The other thing about the pips, of course, is that they're depending on where and how you're listening, it, it's not even right. So if you are relying on them to tell the time, then that's a waste of the time that they're trying to convey because the time signal gets delayed due to how digital broadcasting works and thus you are time-travelling while listening to the pips. It's a beautiful thing when you think about it. 
It may be a beautiful thing for John Holmes, but not everyone is so happy with the digital delay of the pips. 19 minutes to six, and a question of time came up in the House of Lords today. The problem of the difference between analogue and digital radio. This is the first time uh, I can remember that the BBC's time signal has ever been, uh, the integrity of it has ever been questioned. And it, it, it is sending out two different time signals. That was Lord Tanlaw in 2005, capturing the attention of PM listeners after he spoke in the House of Lords about his concern over the inaccuracy of the pips when heard on digital radios. This, as you probably know, is because digital transmissions are broadcast with a slight delay. And today, a lot of us listen digitally. So, if the pips are delayed, how delayed? To find out, I tried a little audio experiment at home. Thanks, Ben. This remains one of the toughest processes. This is my old radio I got when I was 16. Create a virtual escape. That's a trail for Alan Sugar on FM. Here's my digital radio I got 10 years ago. This is back. So excited. And behind me is my laptop tuned to BBC Sounds. Here's my trusty stopwatch. We all know there's a gap. I'm going to conduct a, an experiment to time the gap. The CI player. On 92 to 95 FM, 198 Longwave, on digital radio and on BBC Sounds. This is Radio 4. That's the first pip on analogue. That's the first pip on digital. There's two pips going behind me. Now I'm going to move there. Sarah's already started on FM. I'm going to come over here to my internet radio. What's happening on here? They're still on the Alan Sugar Trail. Minute seconds are going by. You lost me money. Sorry, go ahead. Shush, shush. Come on. You've been using crumble. And the fish cake. Sarah Montague's all the way through her headlines. You're fired. Starts on Thursday on BBC iPhone. On 92 to 95 FM, 198 Longwave, on digital radio and on BBC Sounds. This is Radio 4. Well, there we are. That's about 27 seconds on this stopwatch. And proof of what we all know, Hello, the PIP the is one. delayed Please, by technology. Northern Ireland prepares for a Sinn Féin... For 27 seconds. Now, that seems like a long time to me. But does it actually matter? Do we really need our time signals to be accurate? Why is there a general need for accuracy in time? Uh... This is Richard Hoptroff founder and chief time officer of a company which shares his surname, Hoptoff, which provides precision timing for international businesses. He knows one or two things about this subject. We need accuracy in time so that we can work together and do things in synchrony. You know, if I uh, agree to meet you at a certain place, it's implicit that there's a certain time, and if we don't get that right, we're not going to meet up. In the computer world... Things move much faster, so the timing requirements are much tighter. In financial services, you need very accurate time to work out what happened when. But most people, most of their lives, don't need any kind of accuracy like that. But, you know, if you want to make a Zoom call or you want to catch a train, an accuracy of uh, a second or two really doesn't make a difference at all. Surely we need our time signals to be accurate. It depends how aware you are of how inaccurate it is. Um, if, if I know that uh, it could be up to a minute late, then I can adjust for that. If there isn't a genuine practical issue with this time delay, is there a philosophical issue with it? What is the point of time if it's late? Maybe Professor Brian Cox will be more concerned with our time delay. And here he is with his infinite monkey-caged cellmate, Robin Ince. No, I think there's no philosophical issue with it because that's the way we perceive the world anyway because light travels at a finite speed and so everything that you see is delayed to some extent. Everything's in the past. Everything you're looking at is in the past. Yeah, so that's any issue. The, 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 there is a, there's a philosophical issue or a, a, a scientific issue with assuming that the pips were ever accurate. If you want to know the precise time, then look at your phone. If you want to uh, engage with a wonderful century-old tradition, then listen to the pips. So do they think we still need the pips, or should we get rid of them? 
It's a certain tradition where there's no real reason to get rid of it. And I think in a, in a world which in one way is rapidly moving and rapidly changing, anything which gives people some sense of this will happen every day, that is worth it in itself. Yeah, well, why? What are you going to replace it with? Good question. Maybe whistling. A Sir Terry Wogan pip. Pip. Or perhaps just use a pen and an angle poise lamp, like this moment on the BBC World Service. Uh, stand by, we hope we'll get some Greenwich time signal pips. <coughs> 17 hours, Greenwich mean time. An ingenious response to the occasional problem of pips that go missing. Something that I know all about too well. Well, I didn't hear the time signal, so if you, do, if you heard the pips and I didn't, I hope you enjoyed them. It's nine Here's Jane Steele. For some reason, they have been known to fail, and if the pips don't appear, again, that causes a huge jolt because it, it feels really empty and lonely without them. It might very well be lonely without them, but should we consider learning to grow up and divorce them? We know that this time signal can be a nuisance on air and inaccurate now to our digital audience. So, do we still need the pips? Here's David Rooney. Of course, nowadays, we've got so many other technologies that can give us accurate time to whatever accuracy we want. You might argue, therefore, that the pips have run their course, and that they're no longer needed. But I think there's something more fundamental that's happened in the last century since they first were sounded, and that is they've become part of the landscape of our lives. They're part of our, part of our soundtrack, they're part of our, the tempo of our existence. And that's the important point about the pips today. They don't just live on BBC Radio anymore, they've ingrained themselves into our lives. And these six little dots have broken free. And now the pips pop up everywhere. Maybe you caught them sampled in the music of ELO or the KLF. They were there at the 2012 Olympics opening ceremony, watched around the world. And every day they're on TV, making up the sound of the BBC News theme. Then, in 2012, to mark 90 years of the BBC, stations across the corporation came together, simultaneously broadcasting one specially composed piece of audio. And this is how it finished. When I think of, when I think of the sort of the BBC, I... They're always in there with, with other things like the, um, the beeps. The which, pips. Well, all right, the beeps, the pips. I played around with lots of different things with the pips, actually. I, I sort of did it, I did seven pips, and then I did I, lots of different ones cause, because I've always found there's an extraordinary uh, tension waiting for that sixth pip. The long yeah. one. Yeah, it's like... Damon Alban there the composer of Radio Reunited, telling John Wilson all about his reverence for the pips, or the beeps. That was for the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, and maybe we all think of the pips as being a specially British thing, but we'd be wrong. Perhaps you've heard something like the pips abroad. They've been broadcasting a time signal in Finland since 1926. And on France and Terre, they seem to care little about crashing right through their dots. Or there's a chance you may have encountered pips a little further afield, in Hong Kong perhaps. And in Canada at one o'clock, they have their famous long dash. Or, at least, they did have. Last October, Canada's CBC Radio 1 terminated its time signal after 84 years, and they're not alone. The stories of people who have been listening. At the same time, we're going to turn off the pips. 
Mm, so I know this could be very controversial. This is controversial. Sarah. I'm already getting. Paid. In November, Australia's ABC Radio Sydney celebrated its centenary by switching off the pips. Have they gone mad? Has the audience missed them? Here's Steve Ahern, the manager of ABC Radio Sydney. So they were seen by most listeners as an irritation. Of course, there were some people who loved them because that was just part of the history and they were used to the sound. But by the time we explained all these things about the digital age and buffering and no longer any need for it, almost all of our listeners accepted it. Any chance Steve would bring them back? Would I bring the pips back to ABC Radio Sydney? Definitely not. There's no call for it. The audience um, hasn't battered an eyelid uh, since they've gone, so the pips are gone forever. Gone forever? Could that happen here? Should we prepare for Radio 4 without the pips? This had to go straight to the top. I'm Mohit Bakai, I'm the controller of Radio 4 and 4 Extra and also commissioning director of Speech Audio. So, does he still think we need the pips? We absolutely do still need the pips. The pips are the heartbeat of the Radio 4 schedule. They're one of the many things that makes Radio 4 unique and I love them. I don't think he's alone. 100 years and counting. Here before you. Here after me. The Pips are radio's Ravens in the Tower. Do We Still Need the Pips was presented by Paddy O'Connell and produced by Luke Doran. Well, the very first Pips were broadcast 100 years ago today on the 5th of February 1924 at 9.30pm. On that day, they were introduced by the Astronomer Royal Sir Frank Dyson, Tonight, in just a moment, we'll mark the centenary by playing the pips again at 9.30. But first, to introduce them, here are a few words from the current Astronomer Royal, Sir Mark Rees. Until around 1850, public clocks across the country kept their own local time, noons about 20 minutes earlier in the east and in the west. But the new railway network needed nationwide timetables, forcing all cities to adopt Greenwich time. Until the advent of radio broadcasting, however, there was no easy way for accurate time signals to reach individual householders. In November 1923, the general manager of the newly established BBC, John Reith, wrote to the Astronomer Royal, Sir Frank Dyson. His letter said, I am very anxious that we should make an arrangement with you whereby Greenwich Standard Time could be broadcast all over the British Isles. A hundred years ago today, the first pips were broadcast. We can now, of course, get accurate time on our mobile phones, but it's good that the pips still punctuate our daily broadcasts, along with the chimes of Big Ben, reminding us of the historic importance of Greenwich Time. In everyday life, time is a commodity. We can spend, save or waste it. But these historic sounds remind us of time's trajectory over the centuries. And there they are. Happy 100th birthday, GTS. Here's to the next 100. Radio 4 has been marking the 100th anniversary of the BBC broadcasting The Pips, which are the little tones played at the beginning of each hour. Originally, they were used so listeners could rely on the BBC for an accurate understanding of the time. But the switch to digital radio has made them less precise and brought the practice into question. Amelia Clark has been listening to the evolution of the time-telling tradition over the past century. The Greenwich Time Signal, more commonly known as the PIPS, has since the 5th of February 1924 marked the change of the hour. And for almost as long as the BBC has been broadcasting, people tuning in have heard six bleeps of one kilohertz tone before learning of the most momentous stories of the past century. 
That's how they sounded just before listeners learned of Germany's war in Europe in 1939. Germany has invaded Poland and has bombed many towns. And 30 years later, as audiences waited for man to return from the moon. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin are now resting before preparing to blast off from the moon this evening. The Russian people have been shown seven minutes... The tradition came from a humble desire to give listeners the most accurate time and bypass any human error introduced by relying on a producer's wristwatch. So a connection was set up with the clocks at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich in South London. The time historian David Rooney explains. It had a set of electrical conducts fitted to it so that as the pendulum swung there would be an electrical impulse sent up a telephone wire to the BBC in Savoy Hill, which would then make an audio tone that could be broadcast. That was revolutionary. It had not been done before, and it meant that you could get the time, wherever you were in the country, to within probably about a fifth of a second. But now that people listen on digital radios, smart speakers and mobile phones, rather than huddled over the wireless set, the PIP's accuracy has diminished. And while some question whether the need remains for a slightly less precise punctuation of the news, others find it inconceivable to consider silencing the century-old heartbeat of the BBC. 